Cool. Well, uh, thank you very much for having me. Um, and uh, I'll try to keep this talk pretty elementary because I think I am quite different from many people in this room. Uh, I don't know very much about number theory. But um, hopefully I can, I, I've tried to write a talk which is sort of pitched to things which people are interested in, at least to a, a, light, a light degree. So, okay. um, and so what I want to talk about today sort of lies at a nice interface between something very analytic and something very topological. I don't know quite how to classify it. And so basically, I won't even define what it means to be a minimal service, but you can imagine something which sort of like the, the soap bubble here, if you sort of keep the boundary fixed and you wiggle it slightly, the area goes up, right? So at least, or so to first order the area should not change. It should be a critical point. Maybe you want it to be a minimizer, but for me today, I just want to first order the areas is, is uh, critical. So in, if you know a, a little bit of geometry, that means that's equivalent to the mean curvature being zero. Okay. And so um, this, this problem, so like the, the problem that the soap the soap can solve. If you dip a wire into soap, what does the, the soap look like? This problem is, very, is a very analytic problem. It's, it, it, the, the resolution of showing, understanding exactly what it looks like when you do this is, is very much on the analysis side. Um, but it turns out that there's sort of a, a very curious, much more algebraic side, which actually is all, even older than this, than this, well, older than our understanding of this problem. Um, I think that this problem was older, but the, the the mathematical approach was, was newer. Um, so, so sort of the, the, very, the fact that there's always a soap film, mathematically speaking, was only proven in the, the, the like 1930s, right? So Jesse Douglas won the first Fields Medal for that, for that proof. But actually the idea of minimal surfaces is much, much older and that's because of the following two things. So if you have a minimal surface in R3, so, um, so just if you wiggle a little bit, the area doesn't change to first order. There's two things which are quite sort of amazing about such a surface. So if you, if you take the coordinate functions in R3 and restrict the surface, those turn out to be harmonic with respect to the, the, the Laplacian of the surface itself. Okay, that's a nice computation. You could do that in if you, your first course in geometry of surfaces. You can see that the Laplacian of Xi is related to the mean curvature times something, so okay. And then the second fact is that the Gauss map, so the unit normal vector, so it's moving around, you can think about it as a map to, to S2, which is the same as C, and then that's going to be a meromorphic function. Okay? So these two facts are, are, you know, they're not true in general, obviously, for just a random surface. And this is my only formula. Um, so if you work out what this means, if you think about it a bit, it turns out that a minimal surface is represented. You can think of locally. I think people, this is something which you maybe learn in a class on surfaces, depending on where you learn about surfaces. So locally, it's written as sort of an integral of some, you know, meromorphic one form, the real part of that integral. Okay. And so this fact turns, means that the study of minimal surfaces can be done from a very, very algebraic point of view. Okay. And so, um, this, this goes back maybe to the 1800s. So it's much older than our understanding of soap, our, of mathematical understanding of soap, <laughs> okay? I, I think people, well, I don't know how, they, how well they understood soap then. Okay, so um, lest I sort of convince you that this study is completely algebraic, right? Let me tell you two problems. I won't really say much more, but th this, if you, if you say, okay, great, I know everything about minimal surfaces now because I know about meromorphic functions on on surfaces, there's, there's sort of two problems. And one is there's this real, the real part. And so if you think about it, if this, if I'm, if I want to understand sort of something globally, this would be better, well, better be well defined. So if I go around a closed loop, I shouldn't come back to something different. And so that's some sort of period condition, but it's like a real part of a period is vanishing. So I think that causes, that causes some headaches depending on, I mean, maybe there's, there's things you can do, but it's certainly not purely a, like a complex analytic problem. And also, if you, if you look at this, it becomes very hard to say the boundary of this surface is something. Like, it's very hard to say where the boundary is. It's very hard to say if such a thing is embedded. So sort of, once you go too far to the algebraic side, it's hard to come back to the, the, the geometric picture. Okay. And so um, for today, what I want to talk about are minimal surfaces in R3, with, which have no boundary. So the, the boundary is somehow off at infinity. And here are the, maybe the two, uh, other than the plane, which is sort of the trivial, the trivial surface, although it's very important. 
So the two examples are sort of the catenoid and the helicoid. So the catenoid, you can imagine rotating the catenary, surface, the unique minimal surface of revolution. And then the helicoid, actually, you can, take a, you can take a line, and you move up as you rotate the line, and that sweeps out a, a helicoid. Um, and these are even, I mean, are very old uh, surfaces. They're discovered by, like, the, they were at least considered by Euler in 1744. And so just, just as like a, to, to reconnect with some of you at least, here's the, this is the meromorphic data which is somehow describing these surfaces. And if you're very quick, you notice that it's almost the same meromorphic data, and these are almost the same surfaces, even though they don't look the same. Right. So somehow they're, they're related if you, if you look at C, C3 instead of R3. Okay, fine. All right. So really what I would like to talk about are surfaces with finite total curvature. So the Gaussian curvature is integrable, right? And so the catenoid, you can check quite easily, has Gaussian curvature in L1, whereas the helicoid, remember, it's sort of, it's periodic, right? So any piece probably has finite curvature, but now you add up an infinite number of the same pieces and you get infinity. So my surfaces that I'll consider will look much more like this. And um, the re one of the sort of the, the really beautiful aspects of surfaces with finite total curvature is that they're now related very intimately to the like, geometric, geometric side. So there, there's a theorem, this part of the theorem is due to fischer colbray in 85, and it says that you have a minimal surface of finite total curvature that's equivalent to the surface being finite Morse index for the area functional, right? So finite Morse index, I mean, it's, it's, it has infinite area, so you have to be a little careful, but let's not worry about that. It means that there's sort of only a finite number of linearly independent directions that decrease the area to second order, okay? So they, and I'll, I'll come back to talk about this a little bit. And so in either case, you can really compactify the surface, and so the catenoid, you can sort of, remember, it's sort of got these, I don't know, I don't, I don't have the catenoid anymore, but it has these two things, and you can pull those back, and you get a sphere, and everything extends across these punctures, so it's really, the study of these things is very, very closely related to, to meromorphic data on a, clo on, on a compact Riemann surface. Okay. So, the, like, a basic question, which people are still trying to do today, is to sort of understand what are these surfaces. So just, just embedded minimal surfaces in R3 of finite total curvature. So like, yeah. Sorry, yeah. No, so, okay, so, um, uh, so given, given an embedded minimal surface of R, in R3 of finite total curvature, there is a closed Riemann surface, and there's some data on that surface, but, like, some, one, some meromorphic functions that describe that surface, but you could, of course, change those, and maybe you'll get a different surface, but maybe you won't solve the, the correct, like, maybe this integral I wrote down won't actually close up. I don't know if that, did that, so can you ask the question again? I can try again. Um, I, I'm confused. You're not saying that the objects that you're studying are in bijection? Oh, absolutely not. That's, the, no. Like, um, you, so for example, th there's, there's like a, I don't know if I have an example, but yeah, they're not in bijection. Sure, certainly, yeah. I guess I should have had a picture of it. Yeah, it's quite easy to write down examples of immersed surfaces. What is Buzin? Um, I, I'm not sure what his, he did here, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah, sure. So, so given finite total curvature, you have certain properties. And it, in particular, it closes up to a compact surface. But, but you, can, you, you can, it's definitely the classification is not, not known. So um, until 1990, even the question of are there other, so, the word embedded is very important here. You can, you can come up with immersed examples. Much easier because then it, it's a lot closer to the, uh, the, 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 like, the, 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 the Riemann surface side. And so until 1990, no one even knew if there were examples besides the plane and the catenoid. Okay, so it's kind of incredible. And there's the following picture, which somehow is a torus. But if you can see that this is a torus with three punctures, you're, you have much better geometric intuition than I do. Um, and, and you still went finite. The, yeah, so the, okay, finite. yeah, so the point is somehow, the, 
these these ends are 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 becoming quick fat, flat quite quickly, so that the k is becoming zero fast enough to be an L L one. And so, just to sort of the algebraic side of this is that this this surface is described by sort of the Weierstrass p function in an appropriate form on the square torus. So it's sort of cute. And so the the existence of this is is pretty cool because. So uh, uh, a Brazilian mathematician, Costa, wrote down this data and then showed that, indeed, it gave you an immersed surface. Okay, so indeed, it doesn't give you something with sort of like with a, where you, you go around and you get something different. So it's a well-defined immersed surface. But then he, he couldn't prove that it was embedded. Right? And that was really what he wanted to know. And you know that it's embedded out. You know you can quite easily estimate that it looks like this outside of a compact set. But you don't know if maybe these things are, are like tying each other up. But then in 1990, Hoffman and Meeks, who, like, who used like a very, you know, at that time, very new computer system and saw a picture of the surface for the first time, right? Because you see this data, you don't know, how to, you don't know what the surface looks like. They, they, they made a picture of the surface and discovered that there's actually symmetries here. And using, this, using the symmetries, then they were able to give a rigorous proof once they knew the symmetries are there, then you can find them, and then it's, it's OK. And so they, they were give, able to give a rigorous proof that. Once you see it, you know. Yeah, of course. Yeah. <laughs> but so it's sort of an amazing, I think that's a very cool story. Um, but now I want to say, like, once, okay, once you found one, then you, you, find, you start finding many. You realize that. So this thing, it's supposed to, it somehow looks, it looks sort of plainer out here. You, it's been cut before, before the picture. But there, there's, there's sort of, now it, it's closer to be, there being a zoo of them rather than only two of them. Okay. But yeah, so, so there, there, is, there are continuous families. Um, even this surface, you can bend the, the, this, this middle end. So it's, this one right now is flat, and these are somehow logarithmic. It's playing with the A? Um, no, it's playing with the conformal structure. So you go to a rectangular torus. And of course, this somehow changes slightly. Actually, this more or less stays the same. But yeah, so you, you, can, you, you can bend the middle end, and there's a whole family of them. It's actually a non-compact family. So. Um, and so, yeah, so there's, there's many examples, uh, maybe all genus, et cetera. But now, by now, the, the existence has far surpassed our sort of understanding of the, you know, you can ask very simple questions that we don't know how to answer. And so I, fortunately, I, on the next slide, I can basically tell you everything we know about not about existence, but in terms of like classification. So if you remember that I sort of said Morse index and finite topology are equivalent, they're not, they're not um, you can't somehow understand the topology directly from the index, but it just, just the, the qualitative property is equivalent. And so first, starting with topology, this is everything we know. Okay? So if you're, if you're a genus zero, then you must be the planar, the catenoid. If you have two ends, you must be this catenoid. Or if you have genus 1 and 3 n's, then you're this, this funny costa surface on the, for the torus that I, I wrote down. Okay. And this result even is, is, is quite difficult. It's, uh, it's very involved. Um, I mean, all of them are, are very nice proofs, but here you, it's, you have to work very, very hard. And, so, and then in terms of the index, so index 0 is the plane, index 1 is the catenoid, and recently I proved with uh, Davi Maximo that the index 2 doesn't exist. Okay. So, so there's not that much known, and there's, you can ask a lot of questions. So I'll just sort of uh, finish with here. So in terms of the index, this, this funny uh, torus costa surface has index 5. And so I, it seems very likely that that's the next. You'd like to get pushed to 5 in terms of, say, the next non-zero index is index 5. Um, and I think maybe we can get to index 3. We really don't have any idea how to go all the way. Um, Another quite appealing question is whether or not you can classify all genus 1 surfaces even. I mean, here we understand the meromorphic functions on a genus 1, on a torus quite, quite well, I think, much better than other, other, maybe worse than genus 0, but better than otherwise. Um, and uh, so there's, there's a famous conjecture in this direction, which obviously, given this, we're very far from even knowing whether or not we should believe the conjecture. But there's a, a famous conjecture that says the number of n's should be at least the genus plus two. Okay, so that would say if I, if I wanted, or um, 
Oh, I think I got this backwards. So it should be genus is bigger than n's plus two, right? So that tells me if the genus is one, I definitely can't add any more n. Sorry, I flipped that. So, but so yeah, so these are these are things which I'm quite interested in looking at. 